Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, coming to you from my home studio in Las Vegas. This is the webcast where you can post questions at the URL in the video's description or up there on the screen there at pollgab.com slash room slash Brento, and then uh, upvote the questions you'd like to see me cover. Figured I'd hop in and do a, a quick office hours. I say quick, but uh, do a, an office hours because I'm heading to Detroit uh, to do work for a client. It's kind of nice to get back in person in front of people again. Uh, and then after that, the following week, I'm going to the Pass Summit in Seattle, Washington. Really excited about that to get uh, back together. It's kind of like a family reunion for the Microsoft SQL Server and Microsoft Data Platform folks. It should be really fun. So in the meantime, let's see here. Uh, first up, the highest voted question that y'all wanted to see answered. Sebastian said, hi, Brent. I know that Enver Care Max are bad. Can you explain to me what, to what extent and why? Uh, I have a lot of them in a legacy app, and I would like to understand how critical it is to convert them to fixed length data types. Okay, I'm gonna. The word fixed length data types is a little tricky. I think what you meant there was like Envercare 100 or Envercare 200, like with a number there uh, instead of max. So let's talk about what's the difference between Max and other data types. Max lets people store an insane amount of stuff inside there. And when they store an insane amount of stuff relative to the size of an 8K page, you know, in my How to Think Like the Engine class, I teach you how SQL Server works in 8K pages. If you want to store an unlimited ginormous amount of stuff, that stuff still has to go in pages, but it goes what's called off-row. When you try to put large amounts of data, a SQL Server can't magically fit them into one 8K page, so it daisy chains them across a bunch of other 8K pages. The more that you store, the more pages have to be read, and the longer it's going to take to pull that data back. So on one hand, as long as you're storing the same amount of data, like if you're storing Envercare 100 and everything in there is 100 characters or less, then it's relatively easy to change the application. You could simply go in there and say, I'm going to alter this data type to be Envercare 100. But you know what? You're not going to see big performance differences based on that if people were only storing 100 characters to begin with. Yeah, it affects the way that we do some index designs, but if everything in place is already in place in the application, it's not like users are going to run through the hallway high-fiving you just because you change that data type from max to 100. If people are storing large amounts of data in there, like they're putting spreadsheets or files or whatever else, inside there, then you could see a performance gain by going down to, say, Envercare 100. But you know what? You're going to have to go back through and all that data that's already in the database. You're going to have to have a discussion with the users about, hey, I don't want you storing this much data inside the database. And then you're going to have to get them to change it. So in terms of the bang for the buck, this one's really low. It's going to take a whole lot of work in order to affect that change if large amounts of data are already in there. And yeah, you can see a performance benefit after that, but it's probably not your server's biggest problem. Just make note to the, the folks using the database that, hey, going forward, we should only use the max data type if we're going to put big data in there. And then why are we putting big data in there? Uh, next up, Patrick asks, and this comes up a lot, completely off topic, but what's that object on the wall behind you with yellow lights? That's an everyday calendar by Simone Yetch. Uh, Simone Yetch is an inventor of, uh, she calls herself the queen of uh, crappy robots on YouTube. She's now gone on to industrial design and has all kinds of neat stuff. Um, I also just bought a puzzle from her. She sells this 500-piece uh, puzzle with one missing piece. <laughs> so the whole puzzle is just white, and then there's one piece that's missing, so it should be a fun, uh, uh, fun exercise. That's uh, looking forward to that uh, during the course of this winter. Uh, next up, we have Party Person asks, do you have any opinion on the debate about having SSIS services installed on their own separate server from the engine? I know that uh, there's a licensing thing. Uh, I feel like separating them divides and makes uh, HA simpler. So SQL Server integration services and analysis services and reporting services and everything else 
are free with SQL Server. Kind of like free toys in the box of cereal. If you go to some grocery stores and you go buy a cereal, box of cereal, sometimes there's a free toy in the box that's designed to get you to buy the box of cereal. In reality, when Microsoft wants to charge a whole lot of money for something, they call it the free toy inside the SQL Server box, because the SQL Server box is really, really expensive. So that's why people will say, well, I just want to use the free toy. OK, that's great, but when you start using it a lot, when you use SSIS a lot, analysis services, reporting services, they take more and more CPU power, and you find yourself going to the grocery store, I need more free toys, and you're buying more cereal boxes, aka more CPU licenses, just in order to get the free toy. Well, at that point, if you tend to rely on it that much, you need to understand from the beginning that it is not a free toy. It just happens to be stuck inside the same expensive serial box as the SQL Server engine. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Coffee went down the wrong, <coughs> wrong pipe there. Ooh, and I'll have another sip of it, and that'll surely fix the problem. So if you don't use it that much, it's completely fine. If you only use it every now and then, it's not really that big of a deal. But the more that you use and you start to run into CPU problems, that's where you need to realize it probably needs to be split out onto its own server, and you need to make sure to make a, a big evaluation of it. Did we really pick it because it was free, or did we pick it because it's the right tool for the job? Next up, Mache says, how do you monitor and troubleshoot performance problems on Postgres? So when you do something, so there are several tiers to doing something. Doing it, having a repeatable process to do it, and being able to teach that repeatable process to other people. When I first got started doing SQL Server work, I was just doing something kind of ad hoc, roundabout, clicking around, just guesstimating. And then when I started blogging, I'm like, oh, all right, now I got to like define a process so that I can share it to people because they're going to ask questions. Why do you do this part first? What happens when you do this part? And I had to be able to answer those questions. I am nowhere near the level that I would need to be on Postgres to the point where I could advise you or train you on how to do something. I'm just not there yet. And because of my reputation in the SQL Server industry, like when I say something about databases, people are like, oh, he must know what he's talking about. And you and I know better than that. Um, but because of that reputation, I don't want to start saying things like, here's the way to do it in Postgres. I, I, I'm not qualified to the point where I could do that yet. So I feel bad even sharing how I go about doing it. Um, and when I do do it, like if I, if I decide to share what I know so far, it would all be targeted around AWS Aurora because that's the flavor that I use. And I know that most people out there who are using Postgres probably don't use AWS Aurora. Next up, Medi asks, Hi, Brent. In column store, users table, if you, column store users table, if you run the select count star for a last access date or a special day, some row groups will be skipped. Why? As we know, the table is sorted on IDs. So Medi, it's to, I know uh, I'm going to give you specific advice because you come in here into the blog and the comments questions a lot. I need you to go to the training classes. You ask a lot of great questions, but those are answered in the training classes. And it's time for you to graduate and start going through those training classes because we talk about this kind of topic. The part here where you say, as we know, uh, you're actually wrong. That's not how Column Store works. And you'll learn more about that in the fundamentals classes. So, Mehdi, I'm going to give you a special piece of advice. It's time to type, it's time to stop, take a time out, and stop asking questions until you buy the training courses and then start going from there. Uh, next up, Wong asks Has moving an expensive scalar function to a computed column ever gotten you across the finish line? Um, yes, absolutely. The way that I like to do it is with triggers, and I know that offends people, but if you put a scalar function in a computed column, it makes all access to that table go single threaded, including CheckDB, even if you're not referencing that column. So for me, I like putting the scalar function in a trigger instead. That way the scalar is only called during inserts, updates, and deletes, and it doesn't stop the entire uh, all the queries from touching the table from going parallel. Selects, because they're not firing the trigger, they don't need to know anything about the scalar function, and they don't go single-threaded. 
Uh, next up, DBA team says, my company is looking to save money on our cloud bill. One suggestion was to lower the tier of the secondaries because they don't produce the same load as the primary. Do you see any risks or problems other than the secondary nodes will be weaker in case of failover? Oh, so you don't want to do a failover. You just want to fail. You want to put the fail in failover. Oh, okay. It's an interesting strategy. Most people don't want to put the fail in failover. Evidently, you do. That's cool. Next up, indexing for the win. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm a jerk. Indexing for the win says, index management and AGs is a challenge. Oh, my goodness. Your job is hard. Oh, let me get out the world's tiniest violin and play you a song. Let me see, where is that thing? Oh, I can't find it because it's so tiny. Kind of like your tolerance for work. Uh, what is the best way of doing the death method in that kind of setup? So the easiest way to do it is to gather the data from all of the replicas. You run SP Blitz index mode two, and then you specify the output database name, schema name, and table name. And you can write the contents of SP Blitz index to table. Then that way you can group it across all of the replicas and combine the data. I don't automate that because I also have clients where they have to run it in different locations, like it's a log shipped secondary or a replication server, and they want to combine the data manually. So there you go. Uh, next up, Right Said Fred. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. Right Said Fred said, for SQL DBAs, is managing SQL Server on Linux a nice to have skill, or is it an edge case? How many of your clients run on Linux? My clients? zero. I did have a sales prospect uh, come to me, I don't know, it was a week or two weeks ago. Somebody said, we're running SQL Server on Linux, and we're having these problems with availability groups, and they listed out all of the problems. And they said, we've called Microsoft for support repeatedly, and we're not really making progress. That, to me, is really, it, just the question is really good. Like, if you're running something that hardly anybody else runs and you can't get support for it, you have your answer there. The features that they're using, the, the problems that they're running into, there might be easy solutions for them. But I'm like, I sure don't know it because I'm not going to bother learning it because I don't know anybody who runs it in production for any good reasons. Now, I understand why it was built. It was built, like it feels like, to take over a uh, share from Oracle, but just the uh, number of people do, doing it are just so incredibly small relative to the rest of the world. Uh, next up, El Aguila says, is scan count IO ever a useful metric in comparison with logical reads? No. That was nice and easy. Uh, next up, Haydar says, what interesting queries or reports did DBA Brent like to run against Ola's maintenance stats table? I didn't. Nope, that was easy. Gerardo says, when do you like to show system spids with SP who is active? I don't. Moving on. Chad says, <laughs> it's kind of a speed round there. Chad says, hi Brent, when the legacy cardinality estimator is beneficial for a few queries on a database, do you often see developers adding this hint to queries on their own, or is it more pres typically prescribed so th the problem with it is it takes so much knowledge to A, understand that you have a query plan problem, B, understand that it's related to statistics, C, understand that it's related to the cardinality estimator, because a lot of people just try updating stats and the problem goes away because it's something completely unrelated. D, that the legacy cardinality estimator hint solves the problem. When you go down that list, that's not developers. The developers, I don't want them even going to that level. That's something that database administrators, and particularly development database administrators, focus on. Uh, next up, Hattori says, does the use of parameterized SQL negate the benefits of a filtered index? It doesn't negate the benefit, it just makes it harder to achieve the, those benefits. I get the feeling that because you're asking the question, you know the answer. Because it would be really easy to test that. I am not saying it's a bad question. It's a great question. But you've written out all of the components that you would need in order to test it. You could test that really quickly, and you'll get the answers that you want there. 
Next up, asking for my boss. Ooh, this is tricky. Does Microsoft check licensing status when opening a SQL Server support case? I have no idea. I wouldn't know what they do, you know, internally. That's a really cool question. My hunch is that the answer is no. Because if you even just want to check the licensing status of it, think about it if you're a big giant company like uh General Motors, you know, big, huge, giant manufacturing company. If somebody who works for General Motors gets on the phone, is like, hey, I got a problem with SQL Server, I, they may not even know who has the licensing. It could take hours or even days or weeks to sort out who in the company uh, can identify that a particular SQL Server is properly licensed. Uh, so that the amount of heroic paperwork that it would take to get there is, is kind of crazy. Great question, though. It's really intriguing. It's the kind of thing that, as an end user, you would expect them to do. All right, let me see your paperwork. But I know when I, t I talk to clients, uh, if they're having CPU problems, if their SQL Server is CPU starved, one of the questions that I'll ask is, OK, do, do you know how much licensing you have for this SQL Server? I don't want to see it. I just want to know if you can track it down and go see how many CPU cores you actually bought, whether they're under software assurance. We're not going to wait for that during this call, you know, like when we're working together over, you know, whatever, Zoom, go to wait, go to meeting, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to wait for it. I just need you to go start working on that with accounting or whoever has the licenses so that when we think about does it make sense to add more CPUs, you have a rough idea of what it would look like to buy more CPUs based on the licensing that you're using. And I also say, I'm not the licensing police. I don't care whether you're licensed or not, but you're using this many cores of Enterprise Edition, which costs this much. Would you like help reducing your CPU expenses? That's the kind of consultant slang for, are you really licensed for this? Because then a manager on the call will either go, oh my god, yes, we definitely need help reducing our licensing exposure. Or they'll go, oh no, that's totally cool. We have a, you know, all this huge licensing. We have tons of cores available. We can totally use more if we need to. OK, so we'll stop there. I'll actually record another one back to back just because I have uh, got to go fly out to uh, Detroit and I'll be gone for a little while. So I'm going to throw a few videos in the queue and then I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios, y'all.